On this episode of Recruiting Hell, one of the greatest pieces of advice I ever received in my sales career was, it's all on you. There is no cavalry coming over the hill to save you. Now that can be exceptionally daunting when you apply it to your job hunt. Today, we're joined by a guest who knows this concept all too well and decided to take it to the next level by calling it quits with her HR job at a major pharmaceutical company and striking out on her own to help change the way the world looks at work. Hello and welcome to Recruiting Hell. I'm your host, Rob Conlon. Today is an especially auspicious day for this show as we interview our most prominent guest yet, and she's someone who truly understands and knows the struggle of the modern job hunt. It's a wonderful thing, but before we dive into that, a few quick words about the show and where it's going in the next few weeks. First, if you haven't been over to our YouTube channel to see the video versions of these podcasts, get on over there, subscribe today. Even if you're just a listener, there are often little snippets that don't make it into the main show that you can find there, as well as extras and, of course, bloopers when I screw up and when those happen. Second, somehow the end of season two is coming at us faster than the ground after jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. One of the final episodes of this season will be coinciding with my speaking engagement with Pong Milwaukee on February 1st. As a result, you're going to be getting an extra length uncut episode, most likely on Monday of that week, rather than our normal Wednesday release. We'll of course resume normal Wednesday releases the following week. Finally, a reminder to all of you listening that our free job hunting guide, Six Strategies to End Your Job Hunt for Good, is available at recruitinghell.com. Simply click on the button on the homepage. We'll send it right along to you once you tell us where it's headed with a quick email form. That's it for the opening. Let's get to today's guest. She helps companies, leaders, and HR departments fix work by creating policies, processes, and programs that value the inherent worth of people. Her thought leadership and willingness to help change the way the world works have led her to be featured on media platforms such as NPR, Vox, and CNN. She's the creator of Let's Fix Work, The Cynical Girl, and the host of Punk Rock HR, which Forbes named as one of its top 100 websites for women. It is my overwhelming honor and pleasure to welcome the fabulously talented Lori Rudiman onto the show today. Lori, it is wonderful to have you here. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, it's my pleasure and my privilege. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's get this start party started then, my friend, because it is amazing to have somebody as influential as you on the show today. And I think I probably ran down a pretty good amount of what you've done with your career in the past, you know, 30 seconds or so. But just so our listeners can get a little bit more of it in your own words, rather than the hype reel that I cranked out, <laughs> let's uh, get a bit more about who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, I'd like to start with the human parts first because I am a human being and I'm a wife, I'm, you know, a friend, a colleague, and I'm an avid woman who's involved in the world of animal rescue. So I'm both a cat and a dog foster. And because I have all of that going on in my life, I have to stay adjacent to the world of human resources. So I used to have this job in HR that I hated. I wasn't very good at it. I did it for about 12 years and I thought, nope, this is not for me. I wasn't taking care of myself. I didn't enjoy it. And so I left that world and started writing, speaking, and starting businesses in the world of people and technology. And that has taken me from the Great Recession through today. And I'm one of these business owners that has now lived through two recessions. And I figure if this doesn't kill me, I'm good. Nothing else will. Absolutely. And you know, I've, I've heard from so many people that some of the best businesses, some of the strongest businesses, some of the best ideas start in the worst economies, which is just kind of crazy. So I think that's absolutely awesome. Now, again, knowing your past a little bit and reading on your website and listening to your show, uh, you had a really prosperous career with a, a major pharma company up until about 10 years ago, like you said. Something made you leave the corporate world and kind of get on to the similar crusade that I'm on, which is getting worthwhile work to people. What led you to kind of say, you said you weren't very good at it, but you don't get higher up in places by not being, you can't, it could, it can't have been that bad. What led you to break away from the corporate hustle? Yeah. 
I worked for just a small drug company called Pfizer. They're not in the news or anything just these days, little, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody knows who they are. And I worked there for a couple of years before I really realized that any other time and energy I spent in there would be like diminishing returns. I was working long hours. I was really trying to give it my best, but it wasn't my best because I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't eating right, I wasn't sleeping, wasn't doing the things that I needed to do. And I noticed that the harder I worked, the more my well-being suffered. And it was actually the opposite of what happened at Pfizer because no matter what was happening in the world of work or in the world of the economy, Pfizer did just fine. They reallocated their budget to succeed. And you know, God love them, that's the lesson of corporate America, that businesses exist to be in business tomorrow. And I wasn't doing that for myself. So I had a night at an airport where I was eating Starburst for dinner and drinking, <laughs> yeah, the business traveler dinner of choice and drinking, drinking Pepsi at like, you know, eight o'clock at night with all that caffeine and sugar. And it finally just dawned on me that everything in my life was trending the wrong way. And yet around me, all these people I didn't like, celebrities, politicians, business leaders were living these great lives. And it just seemed so fundamentally unfair to me that I decided to be like Pfizer, to be like all these celebrities, to be like all these politicians and put myself first. And because I'm a good person, that doesn't mean I behaved in evil ways. It doesn't mean that I was cutthroat. I did small incremental things like start to consider my well-being as my top priority. My relationships became important. Sleep became important. And once I started to kind of reconfigure the equation, it turns out that when you invest in the personal, you elevate the professional. And it really changed my life. And once I started to feel better, I'm like, there's no way. There is no way I can continue to do this. But even that journey took a little while because you know, I'm not going to quit a job up and leave. So I had to invest in myself, learn how to build a business on the side while I was working at Pfizer and eventually exit with my dignity and a little bit of money in my pocket so that I could launch phase two of my career. That is so cool. And again, I think for a lot of folks launching either that next step, whether it's working for somebody or working for themselves is a huge thing going forward. And again, that can be a little bit difficult because if we look at the economy right now, you know, unemployment is still awful in America and, and worldwide too. And a lot of people are sort of seeing those, the, the walls kind of close in a little bit because benefits are being exhausted or they're running out, you know, in, in some fashion. And that's driving like a record number of folks to seek things like food assistance, according yeah. to the Associated Press, which I just, I read a great article from them the other day. These are really unprecedented times that kind of make me feel like we're living in, in a version of the Great Depression. And Lori, how on earth with in reinventing ourselves, you know, moving forward for ourselves, investing and betting on ourselves, how do we do that in this really tough environment? Yeah. You know, you're right. It feels like unprecedented times, except as I write my book, it's not. Back in the Great Recession, we lost so many jobs mm -hmm. that have permanently affected middle-aged and older men that they have never returned to the workforce. They have never reclaimed their wealth. They are still dying at record rates from suicide and opioid addictions and alcoholism because of the damage, the trauma that we did to this generation of men back in 2008 and 2009. And my dad is one of those included. He's still alive, but he is not the same man he was before the Great Recession. And so I understand that it feels like unprecedented times, but this playbook is out there. And I think one of the things that people do when they learn to survive and thrive is that they bet on themselves in non-financial ways. So first and foremost, we're in the golden age of learning. There is nothing that you can't learn for free on the internet. Now, credentials are expensive, degrees are expensive, licenses are expensive, but give yourself a head start. If you're curious about anything, hit the Google, hit LinkedIn Learning, hit all of the platforms and start to learn. And you know, I'm a LinkedIn Learning instructor. I actually have a code for anybody who's interested and I will share it with you, my friend, for 30 days free on LinkedIn Learning. There's no catch. 
so your audience can go and learn whatever they want in 30 days and be done with it. They don't need to sign up. That's the kind of community we're living in right now. And we've got to lean in hard to our network, to those free opportunities. We've got to take it on ourselves to change our own circumstances because God knows our employers and our government is not doing it for us. Right. Uh, <laughs> nobody's coming over the hill to save us, there as I said no in the opening of this uh there is no cavalry, that's for sure. And, and that's amazing. And, that, and what a generous offer as well, Lori. I, you know, that's something in my research of, you know, who you are and what you bring to the table. That was something that I missed, that you're a LinkedIn learning instructor. And we talk about LinkedIn a ton on this show. And there's there's excellent certifications to be held, had there. Uh, a couple other resources, of course, Khan Academy for more of the basic education. And then, of course, uh, my personal favorite, and one I'm taking is uh, the folks at HubSpot have all these marketing and uh, social media type ones too. So those are great. And thank you for adding to that little list. You know, the one thing I did want to kind of continue to, to press on here, Lori, a little bit is that sometimes, you know, we talk about learning and that's amazing for us to, to do for ourselves, but sometimes job hunting is just time consuming and it's complex. And it's this thing that is, it feels like it's this big monster that you kind of have to wrestle and tackle so the things that you've maybe learned in your career about kind of getting this thing under control, tell us a bit about, about what you've learned that helps maybe make the job hunt less of a struggle. Mm, good question. Well, first and foremost, I think the job hunt is legitimately a struggle because we make it in HR that way because it works for us for whatever reason. So it does not get fixed until corporate America realizes that these systems they have in place benefit the corporation and not the people. So that being said, workers would show up even in this exhausted, you know, weird way that they do, and they wouldn't be mentally sharp because they're so focused on the trauma in their lives or their crazy job that they have. So first and foremost, it is cliche to say, but it is absolutely true that looking for a job is a job. And one of the things you don't do with a job and expect to do it well is do it 24 seven. You block out some time on your calendar every day, you do it with focus and then you leave it alone. You don't do what my dad did, which was sit in your basement all day long on the internet, trying to find that next opportunity. That's not how it works. You bank those four hours a day or whatever it's going to be for you. You hyper focus on the best practices and we can talk about some of those and then you leave it and you work on things like your individual well-being your relationships with people around you because funny enough in the job search it's rarely the work we do on the internet that gets us a job and it's often the people in our lives who see that we are advocating for ourselves and they want to jump in they want to help us they'll make a referral they'll make a recommendation so for me, the biggest mindset that we need to get away from is being on the internet all day long and trying to outsmart the ATS. The only way to outsmart the ATS is through human intervention. So let's get you out in the world, developing your underdeveloped personal life and having you make those connections even in an age of COVID, so that someone can be your advocate. And I write about that extensively in my book, how you can do that. You can reach out to people on LinkedIn, you can reach into your community and ask for help, but you can also be of service. So when you hear of a good opportunity, you don't just hoard it for yourself, but you share it with others. That kind of reciprocity pays dividends. Definitely. And you know, when you and I were talking about this last week, Lori, in our pre-call, uh, you mentioned some of those interesting topics from your book that you'd be, you know, bringing to us today. And, and before we, we've mentioned the book twice, and I don't think we've I've ever actually put the title out there. It's called "Betting on You." And while I'd love to sit here for you know three hours, and I know you said to me earlier you're you're speaking with other people until nine p.m. tonight, which is wild. Uh, I, I would love to cover every topic on this show, but you've chosen a, you've presented a couple to me that I really had a great peak of interest with. And I wanted to settle for, for some of my favorites here. But the first one that really stood out to me was you said there was a term called a pre-mortem. Huh. And what on earth is that? And how does it make work search better? Well, it's an old stoic exercise that was actually co-opted by businesses and large enterprises. And all it is is an exercise to de-risk something and to beat failure. So NASA now uses it to figure out how is this thing we're building gonna explode and kill people? 
People who build bridges, these amazing engineers, use the pre-mortem to figure out how the bridge might fail. And then they address it before they actually build the bridge. And if you do this exercise, it can reduce your chance of failure and improve your chances of success by over 30%. So it's not a complicated exercise. It goes like this. If you're gonna look for a job and you are super nervous about it, set a timer for 60 seconds and write down all the ways you're gonna blow that job interview. Maybe you sweat too much, maybe you talk too much, maybe you're terrible at eye contact, maybe you mumble, maybe you get easily distracted, whatever it is, make that list. Be silly, be irreverent, be hard on yourself, however you wanna do it. But at the 60 second mark, stop. Then look at your list of glitches, all the things that will go wrong because you know yourself and if you work on a plan to fix each of those glitches, you'll improve your chance of success by 30%. That is a competitive advantage that other job seekers don't have. You've got it. Do the pre-mortem before you meet with anybody, before you do a phone screen, before you send your resume. Are you annoying? Do you email too much? All of that, write it down and then figure out a plan to abate it. And I guarantee it'll pay dividends. That is a completely new strategy for this show. And that is awesome. Again, that's why I'm so thankful you're here because that's what folks come here for. It is a, wow, what a, what a great breakdown of, we know what a postmortem is. People, you know, how did this guy die or how did this rocket explode or whatever it might be? But thinking about that before that, I think kind of stands things on its head, uh, head which is just outstanding. So, I, I do want to interrupt and say most of us do, do the postmortem after a job interview. We're yeah. like, oh, we were terrible. Oh my God, I was so sweaty. That's my thing. I'm like always sweaty. I'm so sweaty. And yet we never do anything about it. And it's the same thing in companies. We build a website and it's terrible. It's ugly. We build another ugly, stupid website. You know, uh, before NASA adopted this, they had Challenger shuttles explode, right? And they had other shuttles explode. And they're like, oh my God, looking back, we made all these mistakes. How about we try to make fewer mistakes or make better mistakes that we learn from instead of making the same mistake over and over again like we're on a treadmill. So for me, the pre-mortem changed everything for looking for work, looking for client work, to figuring out how do I renovate my kitchen with my husband? Turns out we don't huh. because I can't stick to a budget. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? We'll just go out to eat when COVID ends, you know? So. Fair enough. <laughs> well, it's funny, it's funny that, it, that it you know kind of spans through the rest of life too. One quick follow up on that. You're listing off 60 seconds of ways that things can fail or, or maybe ways that you can fail. How is that healthy? I guess is the question I have is that it, a negative self-talk is a very big thing, especially when you maybe are feeling a little bit down because your job hunt has been challenging. How do we put the kibosh on that? to make sure that it's not damaging to us. For sure. But you know what's really unhealthy? Negative self-talk with no plan. The pre-mortem is a limited amount of time where you envision the worst, you envision your failures. And the second step in that isn't just to feel sorry for yourself or blame other people. You know, Pfizer never blamed its father for having a bad quarter. They never said, oh, I've got imposter syndrome, you know, and my dad was bad. We'll give this quarter to Moderna. No, they're like, Forget it, we're gonna go out and dominate the world. So knowing who you are and where you have a chance to improve is a really powerful, positive tool. But the key is the second piece of that exercise, which is action. Really looking at that list of glitches and saying, all right, these are the things I know are gonna fail. How can I at least take a swing in a different way? I think that is very healthy, very positive because the negative self-talk is there no matter what, but this gives you a container and it gives you some action steps, which I absolutely love. Got it. Okay. And that's, that was one I really had a, a real question about when yeah. you, you mentioned this, because again, the negative self-talk can really be destructive, bringing people down a spiral of, of depression and things like that. But good to Push. hear that it's, there's, there's an exit route there, which is great. So another part of the show, Lori, is not only helping people who are out of work find new jobs, but helping people who really detest their current situation find something better. And on other episodes of this show, we've told our listeners to invest in themselves when possible. But there's a portion of your book that goes into that a lot further 
in the chapter about continuous learning. I, I think what uh, it's called never stop learning, I think is, is what it's called. Always be learning. That's always be learning. There we go. So tell us a little bit why about, tell us a bit about why continuous learning is so important, both at your existing job, but also if you're on the hunt for a new one. Yeah. Harvard Business Review has done a tremendous amount of research as to why employees are happy and unhappy. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the happiest employees are learning and growing. And if you're unhappy, and bored at work, it directly correlates to the fact that you're not learning and you're not growing. And if you're not learning, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're not thriving. And what's the point? So there's a bias at work to learn more about the job you're doing, which I think is so stupid because you're already an expert. You're getting a paycheck. You know what you're doing. Sure, you could learn a little bit more, but that's really not your deficiency. You need to build your capabilities elsewhere. So the second piece of that is, most learning and development programs at work are terrible, which is why you need to be your own best advocate and think about what it is you want to do. What's fun? What's interesting? And it turns out most people don't correlate fun and interesting with their jobs anyway. <laughs> like this idea that we're all supposed to be happy at work is one big lie, you know? So I truly believe that the best employees are multidimensional. They're out there learning about music, art, comedy, entertainment. They're, they've got multiple things happening. And then they bring it back to the office, the virtual office these days, and they're so much richer for it. They have other things to talk about and they can also spot and identify patterns in the world. So it's really interesting how someone who's out there just living a good life can see things at work and say, you know what, I saw this on TV or read about this in a book. Even if they don't say it out loud, they can recognize it within themselves and they can start to understand human behavior, human psychology, human tendencies. The other interesting thing is that when you have a robust and rich personal life, it pays dividends in the interview process. When I interviewed at Pfizer, I talked to someone who loved art and had a master's in fine arts. Oh. And I also happen to love contemporary art, just as like an aside, just as a thing I love to do. But we had this really great conversation where we connected on art. And I believe that was one of the biggest differentiators that got me the job. So look at me not being the HR nerd in an interview. I already know I'm fine at HR. Let me connect on a human to human level. That's the power of learning. And that's what I want people to see, not only in my experiences, but in other experiences that I've written about in the book. Got it. And for everybody who's listening, you have your own skills, your own experiences that will gel with other people in the interview process. And it's on you to sus sort of suss that out and find out what is that one thing. And it's funny you mentioned that, Lori, because uh, this week, the newsletter that's going to be going out with this particular episode has an article I wrote uh, about a job I had once applied for, and it's called 12 Crocodiles. And 12 Crocodiles is all about when I received an interview from a what appeared appears to be an absolutely great company. Uh, they had their HR director contact me, and of course, he's got, you know, list of credentials and things like that. But the one thing that when I was doing my research for this interview, I noticed was way at the bottom of his LinkedIn page, he had a little thing that he had done uh, a short story competition a couple of years ago. And his story was about 12, was called 12 Crocodiles. He submitted it to this magazine for an award. And I said to myself, that's the one thing I might be able to connect with him on. And the really cool part about that was, was that when, you know, we had a great interview, it all finished up. And he said, Rob, do you have any more questions before we, uh, we call it quits? And I said, yeah, what's 12 Crocodiles about? <laughs> His jaw hit his desk. I kid you not. And that's exactly what you're talking about oh, is that you have to find that thing that says, whoa, that, that guy knows me. That guy yeah. listens to me and things like that, which is wonderful. So very interesting here when it comes to the book, you know, it's, it's got so much and you got 12 chapters, if I'm not mistaken, that are just really yeah. Fabulous anecdotes and things like that. And I, I love the stories. And, and the other thing, we talked about this right before we hit the record button here. There's a story in there where there's some uh, folks who are doing some indiscreet things at work. And you mentioned that you talked to one of these two people and she said, don't worry, I'll be taken care of as far as, you know, her, her future at the company after this indiscretion. 
And I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that and maybe help dispel uh, the myth that I once believed that, yeah, companies will take care of you. Well, I'll keep it PG rated. But yeah, please I do. <laughs> yeah, because everybody can kind of get the sense of what we're talking about. I saw two people making a poor decision at work, a boss and an administrative assistant. It's very, very cliche. And not only did I see it, but everybody saw it because they didn't close their blinds completely. But instead of anybody going and telling them to stop, everybody just watched. So it was up to me to run around the building in my very poor fitness level <laughs> before I ran marathons. I hustled it across the building and said, dudes, lady, close your close your blinds you know so that's that's the story but after that the administrative assistant came to me and I'm like aren't you worried and she said no he's going to take care of me which is so absolutely naive but it's also an analogy for almost every worker out there at some point in their career to believe their boss has their best interest at heart I'm and, right there I'm right? right there I've been that guy or that lady in this case, <laughs> maybe not the indiscretion part, but you know, thinking your boss has your back, you got to bet on you. You got to make put yeah. you number one. That's right. That's right. And I think there's a way to put yourself first and prioritize your well-being, your career, and to be nice without being a total jerk. And all you have yes. to do is remember that the relationship exists as long as you're getting paid. But the moment this person exits in any capacity, even if they're nice to you, even if they make you a promise, that relationship will end. Now, does it always end? No. But for the most part, it does. And if you just kind of keep your wits about you and realize that you need to run your life like a CEO, your relationship with people around you can be very genial. You can have a very nice time at work, but it's still about business. And I think that's the most important lesson in my career that all of these people I thought were friends were friendly, but you know, you can count your true friends in this lifetime on one hand. And those people are meaningful and they're lovely and you may find them at work, but chances are you won't. So it's time to start running your life like a CEO and make good business decisions about where you spend your time and attention at work. Got it. And again, bet on you. Bet on you. Fun, bet on fun. you. So we've come sort of to the, the time of the show, Lori, where I turn the tables a bit. Um, I don't obviously ever want to give up hosting. <laughs> I enjoy this. I have way too much fun. But what are the what are the things that I haven't asked you today? Not only when it comes to the book itself, but but when it comes to betting on yourself, what should other folks know about their job hunt and betting on themselves that I haven't asked you? Yeah. You know, years ago, I befriended this woman named Jennifer McClure, and she's also a writer. She's an executive coach, works on personal branding. And we were out traveling somewhere at a conference, and she said to me randomly when talking about one of her clients, mm -hmm. everybody good gets fired once. And I was like, whoa, that blew my mind. Is that true? Then I started to think about all the really amazing folks in this world you know, writers, uh, tech executives, inventors, scientists, they have all been fired from something. Jennifer is absolutely right. The key when you get let go, either for cause or because your company just lays you off, is not to internalize it, not to have shame with it, and to recognize it's a business decision and to learn from it and grow. But if you're really good in this world, you're gonna make somebody mad, you're gonna irritate someone, Politics are going to prevail and they're going to let you go. The key, again, is not to feel shame around it and not to let it just stifle your growth and your creativity. And I think for so many who look for work, they harbor the shame around being laid off, being let go or being fired. It's one data point in your entire lifetime. And if you let it dominate your life, if you let it dominate your worldview, that's on you. It's really about learning a lesson from that and growing. I don't know. What do you what do you think about that? Well, I think you have an excellent point there. You know, it makes me bring back, and I've told this story before, but uh, you haven't probably heard it. I was uh, I was fired from my job at the Milwaukee Brewers at Miller Park uh, at the time. This was now almost ten years ago, and I was freshly married to my beautiful wife, and. I got fired and I, I literally went out and sat in the parking lot and I, I just broke down in my driver's seat and things like that. And I came home and I was just beside myself because 
I had been a high performer. I'd been somebody who was very, you know, hey, let's do it. And I just, I was young. I was dumb. I couldn't hack the job that I had. I, I didn't lie my way into it or anything like that, but I just, I bit off more than I could chew. And I totally see that, you know, 10 years down the road here. Yeah. But my wife sat me down after I, you know, sort of tearfully explained to her, like, honey, things are going to get really tough here. Uh, and again, we've been married like three months. So it's like, oh my God, put your marriage through the, the pressure cooker right away. And she said to me, she said, you have the weekend to mope on Monday morning at 8 a.m. I never want to hear anything bad about this experience again. And I think that chop, that axing of the feelings for what happened to me was a massive part of the healing process. And I think that a lot of people who get let go are traumatized because yeah, it, it sucks. And it's something that you feel it wounds you and healing from that is, is, is just so important. So I think again, that one of the most important things, like you said, is realizing that everybody gets fired at least once. And I think that that's a great little, little tidbit for anybody who's experiencing, you know, a layoff or a furlough or whatever it is now that uh, the companies are doing since we're, you know, 10 months into COVID here, it's okay. And it's going to be okay, but you have to take steps to make it okay for yourself and make it okay for the people that depend upon you. Really beautifully said. I love well, it. thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, it's just absolutely perfect. And, and it goes into, I think, maybe looking at resources like yours as well, Lori, because, you know, your book is an easy read. I, again, I had the hardest time writing this episode and getting it done because I kept on, you know, to look at more into you and go, wow, yeah, this is great. I would read 10 pages at a time and go, I got to go write that sentence and ask her that question and things like that. But uh, it really, I think for folks who are looking for maybe some alternative uh, things that, that aren't just the, the basics, I think they should look your way. So anything else that we should know about job hunting in 2021 that hasn't come to the, the surface today that you maybe have a, an inside track on? Well, this is one of my favorite things to tell people, book, no book, my whole mm -hmm. entire career, I've been sharing this piece of wisdom that the most efficient employees and job seekers are truly slackers. They do what they need to do, they get it done, and then they move on to something else. In fact, when I worked in human resources, if someone came to me and said, I'm working 80 hours a week, I'm so exhausted, I'm like, you're doing your life wrong. I want a slacker. I would take a slacker any day of the week because they figure out how to get something done quickly and correctly so they never have to do it again. So if you take that approach to your job and you recognize that nobody can do anything for 80 hours a week or even your job search, you bucket your time, you get really rigorous with your calendar, you do what you need to do to go do a good job and then you let it go. Give yourself the mental space, the ability to think about other things and come to that task Again, when you're ready with fresh eyes, with fresh brain, with renewed energy, slackers, man, they move the world forward. They get it done. And they I'm do. so inspired by that. So when someone makes fun of a slacker, I'm like, you're doing, you're doing your life wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I think one of our, our longtime listeners has a great phrase too. I want something done right? Ask a lazy person. You know, there's, there's your slacker. <laughs> exactly. There's your slacker. They only want to do it once. They don't want to put that extra effort in, which is just wonderful. So Lori. And they get it done right. I just want to say that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They only want to do it once because they, they don't want to go back and rehash it. So my friend, it is uh, just about closing time here. And it's been wonderful to have your bright energy on the show and just Thanks for letting us look under the under the cover of your, of your book a little bit and, and finding some of the fun lessons that are in there and things that will help push those who are listening on to to new heights with their job search and maybe maybe new levels of laziness. With their <laughs> job search. Uh, well, I'm, I'm super honored to be here and I do want to reiterate that while I am, yeah. am on a book tour. Mm -hmm. I do believe in libraries. They are an underutilized oh, yeah. resource. And so I am not offended. And in fact, I'm encouraging people to go to the library, go curbside or get my book via an e-reader. Librarians miss you. They want to be helpful. And they can not only give you access to my book, but also recommend really good career books that are not cheesy and not a lot of homework. So librarians, man, they get it done. So go visit them. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. It's funny, my my next door neighbor is a librarian. He is 
he is missing people like a crazy man because he's super gregarious and he's like i just want to help people do their research and help them find the things that they need so yeah and what no matter how you find Lori's book and, and I, I certainly hope if you have the means you know pick up a copy support a great author and, and things like that uh Lori, anything else that you want to uh, plug before we we bounce you know where where should we find you online where can we uh where can we pick up that fabulous book of yours? Yeah, I've got a fun little website called bettingonyoubook.com. Free resources, access to everything in my ecosystem, the website, the blog, the podcast, all that good stuff. But more importantly, I would invite anybody to come connect with me on LinkedIn. And if I can be helpful, I will. Awesome. Well, excellent, Lori. Thank you again so much for being so generous here. You know, again, shameless plug for the book again. Betting on you. It's by Lori Rudiman. She's fantastic. Pick up a copy wherever you uh, you feel like. And again, uh, I've read it, and you know, we this is something that we just want to make sure that you have the best resources here on recruiting hell, listeners. You know, we want to make sure that we bring you quality things, and I think we've done that today with you, Lori. So thanks again for uh, cluing us into everything that you do. And again, I had a terrible time pulling myself out of your book when I was writing this, so this was just a delight to actually talk to you and get a get that all handled. Thanks again, my friend. It was great to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for coming by. Closing out for us here at Recruiting Hell, a reminder that we've set a mission for this show. We want to educate 10,000 job seekers, help 100 of them get a new job directly by applying the knowledge that they learn here on the show. And we want to save 10 lives from deaths of despair by helping get the world back to work. Remember, you are worth more than your work. We're going to get that code for you that Lori mentioned in the episode. It'll be in the show notes at recruitinghell.com. And of course, you can find us all over the internet. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and YouTube. For more from the show, visit our website, recruiting-hell.com, where you can find our blog, social media accounts, show notes, and links to both our tea public and our Patreon page at recruiting-hell.com. It helps support your job hunt further by supporting the mission of the show and, of course, the great work that this show does. If you're looking for more information to start your job hunt, be sure to grab our free guide at recruitinghell.com. We'll email it directly to you to help get your job hunt going. Just click that little button on the front page, drop in a quick email into the form that shows up, and we'll be in great shape. Feedback, questions, and comments can, of course, always be directed to the Recruiting Hell Podcast at gmail.com. Recruiting Hell is a production of Westport Studios and is proudly made in Cheddarland. I mean, Wisconsin. <laughs> Finally, as always, a big thank you to Purple Planet Music for our themes and you, the listener, for tuning in. I'm Rob Conlon, and until we meet again, keep moving forward with your self betterment and your job hunt. It's a marathon, not a sprint, and Recruiting Hell will be here to help you keep pace.